uh, have a Bible with you, I invite you to join me in the book of Mark chapter 5. Uh, I'll be reading some different sections from that text. Part of them will be in the New King James. The other part will be in the NIV. But uh, we're going to read quite a few scriptures this morning just for the sake of creating proper scriptural context for where we're going in the Word. Um, we've been in this series that we've been entitling Just Making Waves. And uh, that's really what we want to empower you to do is to be um, equipped with the Word, empowered by the Spirit to go make some waves in your community. Uh, in your sphere of influence, in your family. And so if you would look with me at Mark chapter 5, verse number 2, it says, And when he, speaking of Jesus, had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So Jesus is getting out of the boat, and this man who's got some really deep, significant internal issues going on comes to meet Jesus. This man had been dwelling among the tombs. He'd been hanging out among death. And no one could bind him, not even the chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones, for he said, but, but Jesus, drop to verse 8, then Jesus says to this man, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And the demons within this man said, my name is Legion, for we are many. And also he begged Jesus earnestly that Jesus would not send them out of the country and now a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains. And so all the demons begged, saying, Just send us into the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. And then the unclean spirits went out, entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned. Now, verse 14 from the NIV says it this way. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what happened. I want you to see verse 15. It's the verse from which we'll draw our title this morning. It says, And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Um, today I'd like to share with you on the subject of the man who had been, the man who had been. And right before I pray, I give you two more passages just for your reference. John 10, 10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, but Jesus comes to give life that you may have it more abundantly. Ephesians chapter three, verse 10 says, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. Father, I ask you to help me to preach, help me to teach, help me to share your word, help me to yield the sword of your spirit with skillfulness. God, show me where to pierce, show me where to heal. Let somebody leave this place different than they came, God. I pray, Lord, that you will do a work for which coincidence cannot take the credit. Lord, let it be done in Jesus' name. And this church said, amen. amen. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to beg to go to the circus. And there was a lot about the circus that I enjoyed, obviously, as a child. But my favorite part was always when the lion tamer would take center stage. And he would come out, and the lion would come out, and many times with nothing but a whip and a chair, he would take complete seeming authority over that lion. He was called the lion tamer. Um, I wonder, with that visual in mind, have you ever tried to tame some part of yourself? Have you ever tried to tame some part of yourself? The truth of it is that, that uh, all of us have some kind of a lion on the inside of us that likes to roar and likes to try and devour and likes to uh, be as disruptive as it possibly can be to the plans that we have and that ultimately God has for our life. So I ask you again, like, have you ever tried to tame 
some part of your life. Maybe you've tried to tame your temper. Maybe you've tried to tame your lust. Maybe you've tried to tame your tongue. And the Bible actually has something to say about that last one very specifically. In the book of James chapter 3 verse 7 it says, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed. Watch this. And have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil. It is full of deadly poisons. And so think about that part of you that you've been struggling to tame. That part of you that just continues to come loose from being subdued. You've uh, been struggling with your temper, perhaps. Maybe you've been struggling with your lust, perhaps. Maybe you've been struggling with your tongue. And, and maybe what you've discovered is that in your attempts to tame the wildness of your flesh, your thought was, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to self-impose some restrictions on myself. And, and as I self-impose these restrictions, I'm going to keep myself from messing up again. Uh, maybe you've been in this cycle of sorts where that maybe you thought, okay, if I'm going to self-impose these restrictions, if, if I'm going to keep myself from messing up, if I'm going to tame this flaw that's within my flesh, I'm going to need to throw my laptop away because you just couldn't stop opening up the wrong websites in your browser. Maybe you've thought, okay, I'm going to delete that app from my phone. Because it's that app that's causing me the issues. And if I'm going to tame my flesh, then I'm going to, I'm going to delete that app. Uh, maybe you've even had a particular individual or a particular relationship that you've been struggling with. And so you decided, okay, I'm going to block that contact. And I'm not going to be calling them anymore or receiving calls from anymore. I'm not going to be texting them anymore. I'm going to tame this situation. I'm going to block the call. And it's not that any of those things are bad ideas. There may be a time in your life where it is certainly time to make some kind of a change and maybe to take some significant change. But what some of you have discovered is that you threw that laptop away and then you had to go use your credit card to buy another one. I can't get no help on a that you deleted that app on one device and then just installed it on another device. That you blocked their contact and then you had to scroll through and Google how to unblock their contact. That it didn't seem to have the effect that you wanted it to have. Now, now in those moments, mo most likely you weren't possessed by a demon, but you most certainly were tempted by one. And so what was happening is that the enemy was, was trying to draw you away, trying to stir up your flesh, trying to keep you from taming that part of your life that was not conducive to God's will for your life. And, and that's what Scripture says will happen. Pastor Joe Dobbins, who was here a few weeks ago, uh, shared an incredible message on how sin works and how that there can be even dangers in open doors because sin can be crouching on the other side of that door, waiting to devour you, waiting to attack your life. And that's what the enemy does. He, he draws away. He finds something that entices you, something that appeals you, something that will stir up that part of you that you've been trying so difficult and so intentionally to tame. And so when you become unsuccessful in pinning yourself in, it can be very discouraging because you thought I, ha I had it tame. I, I, I had it caged. I, I had this thing corralled. I, I had this thing fenced in. I'll never call him again. But you did. You broke the chain. And that's what you had hoped was happening is that you were going to be able to chain yourself and therefore tame yourself. I, I'll never lie to them again. But you did. You cut the rope. No longer tame. I'll never take that pill again. But you did. You snapped the leash. So as hard as you tried to leash yourself and rope yourself and chain yourself and tame yourself, it 
you just kept doing it again and again and again, despite all the times that you said, I'll never, but you did. And I did. We all do. Over and over and over again. And so here's the thought this morning. None of us want to be likened unto a madman. Can I get a witness? Like, like we, but, but yet, one of the working definitions of insanity is to continue to do the same thing over and over again with the wrong results. So, so we don't want to be likened unto a madman, but yet in the passage of text that we've chosen as an anchor for this morning, a platform to build from, there is a madman. And this madman has an issue. There is something unclean going on in his life. And no one can tame it. He can't tame it. Counseling hasn't tamed it. Medical assistance hasn't tamed it. Nothing has tamed it. He's struggling. He can't get this thing tamed. And so they, they even incorporate change to try and tame the issues this man's got in his life. And even the chains won't work. And while that speaks in a physical term, what we're doing this morning is we're allegorically applying the reality of that situation to the spiritual stuff that's happened in our life. Because if, if we're honest, it, it, I, I get it. Some of you will never admit you got this stuff going on in your life. So maybe I'm not talking to everybody, but I'm talking to somebody this morning. That there are some things that are going on in your life that are driving you mad. Because you are at a place where you're like, I know that this is not God's will for my life. I know that this is not God's purpose for my life. And yet everything you've tried to do to tame it, you keep breaking the chain. And there's a frustration that's on the inside of you. And, and, and it's almost reaching this place of desperation on the inside of you. I don't know how to tame this situation. And so I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that something we all know is that negatively, or excuse me, typically, there's a negative connotation associated with chains. Typically. You think about chains, it's, it's something negative. But, 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 but I believe that we've all broken something that we actually hoped would chain us. I want you to see this passage of text again. Mark chapter five, verse number three. It says, this man had been dwelling among the tombs. This guy is so down and out that he has decided that a perpetual association with the things of death is the best habitat for his continuation. He is surrounded by death. And nobody can bind him and not even chains because he had often been bound with shackles and he'd often been bound with chains, but the chains had been pulled apart and the shackles had been broken in pieces and neither could anyone tame him. I, I bet you've tried several self-help mechanisms to tame some kind of behavior, some kind of an addiction some kind of a character flaw, especially before you came to Christ. There was probably these multiple attempts to tame. But I wanna show you something in Psalm chapter 65 that I think could be a game changer for every single one of us. In Psalm chapter 65, there's somewhat of a summary given um, by Eugene Peterson. He says this, all your salvation wonders are on display. Tell your neighbor he's talking about God. All your salvation wonders are on display. Anybody saved and you know it this morning? All your salvation wonders are on display. I'm gonna tell you something. If you would just look around this room today right now, you would see that his salvation wonders are on display because a lot of us, we didn't used to look this good. You see this, the Lord did this. Y'all just tell somebody, look what the Lord has done. If you're in church online this morning, you might just need to get a mirror and just look at what the Lord has done. Watch this. All your salvation wonders are on display. Earth tamer. Just look over somebody and tell them, earth tamer. Tamer. In case you haven't figured it out yet, I am an audience participation preacher. 
mountain maker, heel dresser, muzzler of sea storm and mobs in a noisy riot. Thank you, God. Far and wide, they'll come to the trophy rooms of heaven. They'll stare in awe and they'll wonder. Now, when, when, when I begin to recognize my own shortcomings and my own flaws and all the places that I have unsuccessfully been able to tame those lions, I, 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 I don't know about you, but even this week, I, I struggled to tame my tongue. I, I just had a moment. He just... You never had a moment, just, just had a moment where all of a sudden there was something I just really felt like I needed to say. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit was trying to tell me, no, you probably don't need to say it, but God, I really do want to say it. And I really feel like it needs to be said. And the Holy Spirit, and, 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 and all those places that we've broken the chain, all those places where that we have repetitively failed to remain tame, there is some good news for you and me that when our fleshly strength fails, we will discover that it is not by our might and it is not by our power, but it is by his spirit, saith the Lord, because he is the ultimate earth tamer. And there is one greater than you that if you will surrender and consecrate yourself to him, he will set you apart in such a way that you will become a wonder of salvation because the old things will have passed away and the, and the, uh, and the things will have become new to the point that people who knew you in one way will now be amazed at the new you and who you have become in Jesus Christ. He is the earth tamer and he will tame the seas and he will tame the winds and he will tame the heart of man. And that's exactly what we discover in this event. Nothing had worked for this guy. Nothing had been successful. But in Mark chapter five, verse eight, when the man presented himself to Jesus and he finally got sick and tired of being sick and tired and he came out of the tombs and he came out of the suicidal mindset and he walked over to Jesus and he's like, I really need something to be done about this. Jesus looked at that man and he said, come out of him, you unclean spirit. Spirit. And with one statement, Jesus relocated thousands of demons. And they were not just any kind of demons. They were militant demons. Because when Jesus asked them to identify themselves in Mark chapter 5 verse 9, they said, we are a legion. And that was a term directly connected to the Roman army. And what it meant is that there could be up to 2,000 demons in that one man who were stra strategically, militantly attacking his life, attacking his family and attacking his community through him. But when Jesus showed up, it didn't matter what kind of a military strategy hell had because heaven pushed it back. And I came to tell somebody, it is time to once again pray in your life. Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven because we are certainly in spiritual warfare. And when you read Ephesians chapter six and it talks about principalities and powers of the air, when you read the book of Daniel and it talks about the fact that Daniel warred in prayer for 21 days and there was with this clashing of swords that were happening in the heavenlies. When you read the book of Revelation, what God's trying to get through to you and me is that there is a militant attack against your life from hell itself. And hell wants to do everything it can to strategize your demise. But one statement from Jesus Christ can, relo yes. can relocate all of the attack. And so you don't have to be afraid of the spiritual warfare. You don't have to be afraid of the strategy that the hell's trying to employ against you. You don't have to settle for the constant breaking of the chains in the place where that you have not yet been tamed. You don't have to settle for going into the darkness of a tomb-like thought process because if some of us were to be honest, in our mind and in our heart, we are hanging out in the tombs. We're, we're so defeated. We're so discouraged. We're so down and out. We're so mad at ourselves because we keep breaking the chains. But Mark chapter five, verse 15 says, when they came to Jesus following this incredible moment, they saw the man who had been. Who had been. The man who had 
been possessed by this strategy of hell. And now he's sitting there and he's dressed and he's in his right mind. He had been. Does anybody know what it is to be the man who had been? Listen, I'm not everything I want to be. But by the grace of God, I'm not what I used to be. I know what it is to be the man who had been. I know what it is to be violent and angry. I know what it is to be victimized and molested. I know what it is to let those events and those happenings begin to direct your life until you're standing on a hillside with a 357 cocked under your chin. I, I, I know what it is to, to go through the teenage years wrestling with purpose and calling and instead of going the right way, just go further the wrong way. And I know what it is to sit in a service and, and get convicted and run to an altar and think, I'm gonna chain myself and I'm gonna get this right and then go right back out and repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. But I also know what it is to have a Damascus Road experience at mile marker 82 on the Cumberland Parkway and once and for all see him reach further down than I was ever able to reach up. I I know what it is to see old things pass away and everything to become new again. I know what it is to be the man who had been. And I believe that that's what God is trying to raise up in churches all across America and this globe is a bunch of people who had been. You had been suicidal. You had been depressed. You had been oppressed. You had been angry. You had been lustful. You had been an adulterer. You had been a thief. You had been a cheat. You had been addicted. But now by the grace of Jesus Christ, here you sit, dressed in the presence of Almighty God. And there is nothing but hell can do but stare at you in awe and wonder. I wish somebody would give him praise on a Sunday morning. We are the church that had been. The people that had been. Had been. Y'all just look at somebody and tell them I had been. Some of you are saying your grammar is not correct. Hush, I'm getting my doctorate. <laughs> hey, I had been. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I feel the unction of the Holy Spirit to try and help somebody this morning. I was in prayer this morning. I was praying over delivering this message. And I just started to sense that there are people that I will get to speak to this morning, that you have tried everything to chain yourself and nothing has worked. You've tried to stop the affair and you keep going back to it. You tried to stop the addiction and you keep going back to it. You tried to stop losing your cool and flying off the handle and having a fit of rage and you keep going back to it. You tried to stop saying that stuff and you just keep going back to it. And the enemy has turned your mind into a place of the tomb. And it's like, this is how I'm always gonna be. It's just who I am. And I just hurt people. I just, this is just me. I just can't stop. The devil is a liar. Yeah. 
And one statement from God can change your whole life. When you come to realize you will never be able to tame your flesh by yourself. But when you put your eyes on Jesus and you begin to see the power of the cross, you begin to realize that you don't have to tame yourself because he'll take care of it for you if you will continue to redirect your faith towards his power and not towards your own fleshly restraint. God is not here to modify your behavior. He's here to break the need for a chain. That's right. Come on. To set you free as a born again, new creature in Christ Jesus. Could you just one more time help me preach, look over at somebody and tell them I had been. I had been. I had been. I had been. Mark chapter five. Verse 16, something crazy happens. This has all happened and, and people are in awe and people are in wonder and it's a miracle that's taken place. And, and those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been possessed by the demons and about the swine because what happened, Jesus cast the demons out of the man into the swine. And these people look at Jesus and said, get out. Not everyone is going to appreciate the change in your life. Because some people will be more concerned about what they possessed than what possessed them. And they liked the fact that you were complicit in their bad life choices. And so when you don't participate any longer in the situations that surround the tomb, there's going to be a conviction that comes to their life and they themselves will have to make a decision of whether they want the same freedom that you are now experiencing and you are encountering. Because what Jesus was trying to show that audience it's what I believe to be one of the greatest illustrative sermons in the history of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Jesus looks at this man and he, he says to the demons, come out. And he casts these demons into the swine. And so thousands of demons come out of this man and go into thousands of pigs. And the pigs, now these demons have begged, like, let us stick around. Give us a second chance. And so Jesus relocates them from the man to the pig. And the pigs then run down a hill and immediately the demons drown the pigs. What an illustration. That the enemy is only concerned about one thing regardless of what he's been whispering to you. He has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it will always be progressive he will steal, he will kill, and he will not stop until there is total and complete destruction. When someone starts to align their conversation and their personality with the enemy and become a spiritual host to darkness, the enemy will perpetually use the union and that alliance to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But that is not God's plan for your life. And you probably already know this, so I'm here to remind you. John 10, 10, yes, that thief is come to steal, to kill, to destroy. But Jesus has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. In other words, you are totally and completely set free. And the way that that more abundant life is described by Paul is in Ephesians 3.20. It says that our God desires to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think according to what he's doing in your life and the power that he's deposited there. When you think about exceedingly, what it means is that it continues to grow and it's more this time than it was last time. It's abundantly. It happens in large quantities. It's overflowing. It's more than you can contain. You're gonna have to tear down your barn and build a bigger one. It's abundantly. But it's above all that you could ask or you could think. 
eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard the things that God has for those that love him and are called according to his name. It is above all. Anything this world has promised you, anything this world has offered you cannot even begin to compare the things that God has for you if you'll stop hanging out in the tombs and put your eyes on Jesus Christ. Exceedingly, abundantly, above all. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying when he said, I've come to give you life that you may have it more abundantly, more abundantly. It means preeminence. It means surpassing all others. And so I don't know what you've experienced in God up to this point, but the encouragement I have for you this morning is that whatever the enemy has stolen from you, whatever you have lost, you serve a God who can restore what the canker worm, the locust, and the palmer worm hath eaten, according to the prophecy of Joel chapter 2. And not only does the Bible say that he can restore what you've lost, but he says he can restore the years that you have lost. If you will give your life to God, he can give you back in three years what you lost in 30. He can give you back in a... He can give you back in a month what you lost in a year, but you have to make the decision to decide, I am done hanging out in these tombs and I'm done trying to chain myself. I need the help of the Holy Ghost for such a time as this in the name of Jesus and you will have life and you will have life more abundantly if you'll stay at the foot of his cross. As you receive, do you receive this word this morning? Come on, do you receive this word this morning? There... They're going to play some music, and I want you to look at somebody one more time and just tell them, if you're the man, you're the woman, you tell them, I had been. I am the man that had been. I am the woman that had been. I had been, but thank God I am not who I had been.